Revolution Radio proudly presents live from Phoenix, Arizona, the Truth Deny Talk Radio with host Roxy Lopez. Join us here for topics you won't hear about on mainstream news, such as chemtrails, GMOs, nutrition, and conspiracy facts regarding your personal sovereignty. Humanity is 7 billion strong. We are the majority. And now, live from the Valley of the Sun, your host, Roxy Lopez. The top of the second hour now, if you're just joining the program, uh, we were just uh, talking about some of the technology that uh, exists in the skies and some uh, coverage, footage, photos. Now that we've laid that all out for you, my next guest, which uh, is a returning guest and uh, a buddy of mine, Mark McCandlish, and uh, just a little background on Mark. You know, he's well known as a conceptual aviation designer and has also been a part of the UFO Disclosure Project. And uh, Mark and I were talking the other day about holograms and how they're made, and we sort of. Uh, I don't know. Mark's just got a way of explaining and expressing this type of technology that no no one else I know does, I, and that's the truth. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about today that holographic technology and what is UFO technology versus uh, exotic military craft technology, and perhaps we'll even get Mark to uh, comment on uh, the chemtrails and are chemtrails covering our skies for a reason bigger than than what we've already sort of figured out on our own. And without any further ado, I welcome back to the show a wonderful guest, uh, Mark McCandlish. Hi, Mark. Thanks for being here. Hi, Roxy. Thanks for having me back, and thank you for all the kind words. Oh, it's not. It's 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 so easy. It's so easy to to talk about you that way, Marcus. You're just you're always an upbeat guy. I don't know how you do it with all the information that you've got. <laughs> uh, anytime <laughs> I talk to you, I learn something new. But you know, we can jump right into it, Mark. Um, you know, we were talking about uh, in the first hour some of these crafts that are being filmed in these, you know, clouds, uh, uh, and the dispersal of clouds uh, when these crafts reach these clouds, and then the cloud sort of just breaks up into a million pieces, and weather patterns that seem to be super, super unusual up, uh, associated with these types of craft, and um, and and then also wondering. You know, you've heard, I'm sure, the the uh, types of words like skyfish or, um, of course, UFOs, of course, and uh, holograms and holographic images. And, you know, what would be the whole point of it, really? I, I don't understand. I mean, the fake UFO, UFO invasion type of thing or, you know, I mean, we're getting kind of mixed up as a public, Mark, because yeah. – some of this isn't real, some of it is, some of it's military craft, and what the hell are the chemtrails for? You know, excuse my language, but, you know, let's tear it apart. You're the person that can do that. You you, you can scientifically reason all this out and um, fill in some of the blanks for us. Okay. Well, what we're finding with uh, chemtrails in particular, and we see an awful lot of that up here in Northern California where I live, uh, what we're finding is that they're, are a variety of materials that are being used in the chemtrails, and it appears that uh, the not only the materials being used are uh, somewhat unusual, such as aluminum oxide, uh, some of the different salts of barium, and another material called strontium, which is uh, mildly radioactive in some isotopes. Um, we're finding that the the way that these kinds of materials materials are being put into the atmosphere is, is somewhat unique also. And there's, there's uh, probably six or seven different ways that uh, these materials can be uh, manufactured for this particular type of dispensing into the atmosphere. And the, the, the most common uh, thing that we're finding are what they call nanoparticles. Now, nanoparticles can be produced in, in a number of different ways, and it, it probably... Uh, doesn't serve our purpose here to, to go into too much detail about that, but be it suffice to say that nanoparticles, imagine uh, that you could look under a microscope at what you thought was uh, a very, very fine, fine powder. I mean, it's fine or finer than talc. But when you look at it under the microscope, each one of the granules is a perfect sphere. Now, that by itself is pretty astonishing to think that you could have something that looks like just ground-up powder 
and when you look at it at the finest uh, scaling, optically, you find that each and every one of the particles is not only a perfect sphere, but those spheres are all exactly the same size. Now, that particular characteristic uh, allows you to do a number of different things. Now, if you, well, if you remember back in, the, I don't know, the 60s or 70s, uh, the, the famous uh, black uh, songstress, uh, Elle Fitzgerald, uh, was um, hired to help um, a company, I think it was BASF, uh, a company that manufactured high-fidelity uh, magnetic tapes for uh, in cassettes and that kind of uh, recording device, something that was more common back at that time. Um, she was recorded hitting a particular uh, note with her voice that hit the exact resonant frequency of a champagne glass and was able to shatter the glass with the sheer intensity and the, the, the pure fidelity of her voice. And so what they did is they recorded this particular note and then after she was done, they brought up another champagne glass and they played the, the tape back. And the fidelity was so perfect that the tape recording was able to accomplish the same thing that Ella Fitzgerald had done with her initial uh, you know, vocalization. So what this kind of demonstrates is that uh, you can have uh, a particular kind of frequency sound-wise that will cause a destructive kind of resonance to occur in the structure of a glass. But you can also do this electronically with electromagnetic waves or radio frequency waves. And the smaller an object gets, the, the smaller the space within that object is for any kind of resonant frequency to occur. So the rule of thumb is that the smaller an object gets, the higher the frequency, meaning the, the, the small, well, you've heard of short wave. Short wave basically is kind of a, a, a sort of a generic way of saying microwave or extremely high frequency. Uh, the shorter the wave means the shorter the duration of the pulse, the little S-shaped sine wave. That basically uh, amounts to one cycle or one hertz. And so the higher the frequency means that there's more and more of those cycles occurring for every second of time that passes. And we're talking about microwave frequencies that go up into the billions of cycles per second. So when you have a, uh, a particle of, say, aluminum oxide um, that is maybe one-fortieth the diameter of a red blood cell, imagine that for a second, that you're looking under a microscope and you've got a red blood cell floating in, in the... Uh, in the viewfinder of your microscope, and right next to it, you've got 40 little tiny particles that are perfectly manufactured spheres of aluminum oxide. Because of their extremely small size, they require an extremely high frequency, the kind of frequency that you would expect to find being produced by a radar system or even by the, uh, the, the, um, the high-frequency uh, active Aurora Research Program, or HARP system that's up in Kokona, Alaska. And there's a number of other systems around the world that operate on the same principle. The idea being that if you can send a frequency out into the environment, and it is a frequency that specifically causes particles of this size to resonate and vibrate, that vibration, that resonance that occurs in these particles, it converts the radio frequency energy to heat to the vibration of the particle so it actually produces heat. Now, if you take an airplane that's, that's basically spraying uh, thousands of tons of this material into the atmosphere, and we know that there's many, many planes worldwide that are doing this all the time, you have a tremendous volume of this material being put in the atmosphere. As one of my friends is fond of saying, a mountain of metal is raining down on us, and that's literally true. But if you have particles that are all exactly the same size, what that means is if you hit those particles with a particular frequency that is broadcast from one area into another, you can cause all of those particles to resonate and vibrate at the same time. And when they do, they will heat up. And what happens as a result of that? They heat up the surrounding air. Now, what happens when air gets hot? It rises, just like the... Uh, the, the, the turbulence that you see coming off of a highway in the Arizona desert near where you live, the, the convection, the rising air, causes this, this pattern, this waviness that you see in the distance, and that's the heat that's rising. 
Now, when you get these particles all heated up, it causes that entire air mass that's being painted with this signal. It causes it to rise in unison, and when it does, it causes a tremendous displacement of air. It moves up into the upper atmosphere, and because the particles themselves have a tendency to accumulate or condense moisture, uh, act as what they call nucleation. Um, uh, it's a nucleation process, and these individual nanoparticles of aluminum act as nuclei for the moisture to condense on. You can actually form what is called a low-pressure system, or like a storm, where all of this moisture is taken up to a higher altitude where the temperature of the atmosphere itself is much colder, and so all of the, the water vapor begins to condense into droplets of rain. Now, by being able to control where this, this uh, uh, radio frequency broadcast uh, targets these particles in the air, you can actually cause the air to rise up a little bit at one place and then sequentially you move it, that broadcast target to an, another spot next to it and a little bit further downrange each time. So you can actually cause uh, a shifting in the pattern of air movement to the degree that you'll actually be able to control the, the, uh, the direction of the jet stream. You can control the, the path of storms. You can even augment the activity within a storm, such as making a, a hurricane change direction or causing a, a tornado to form by enhancing the shearing forces between two weather systems, which is typically what causes tornadoes to happen. You have a low-pressure and a high-pressure system uh, or maybe even two low-pressure systems that are moving in opposite directions. And so what happens in, in the buffer zone between those two uh, uh, weather systems, you have uh, two masses of air that are moving in opposite, opposite directions. And just like rolling a pencil between your two hands, it begins to stir up the air into a, a, a sort of a tornado pattern, and it creates these, these massive uh, tornadoes that are so destructive. So these are all things that you can do by putting materials into the atmosphere, uh, energizing that material or, or this, the bulk of the material with uh, an electronic signal that comes from a, a, a source that's remotely placed or in a, def a different area. And, and by doing that, you can, you can uh, cause some, some really dramatic things to happen. And so this, this is just one of the things that you can do with chemtrails uh, by augmenting the, the presence of this material in the air uh, with uh, radio frequency signals. Now, do you think that um, there is something else going on beyond weather manipulation? In other words, are there multi-uses for this? Well, there absolutely are. I mean, and, you know, your imagination is, is really about the, the limit uh, to which you can go in terms of, of the different things that can be done. Uh, I'll just give you kind of a short list. Um, you know, of course, um, the military applications are pretty well documented. There's a, a, a paper that was generated by the Pentagon, I believe, some years ago, 1995 or thereabouts. I think it was called Owning the Weather by 2025, and it really just talks about the weaponization of weather and using it as a way to, um, as they call it, uh, as a force multiplier, being able to, to give yourself an advantage by putting your opponent um, in the middle of a big storm. And when, when a really terrible storm comes in, say a storm that's dropping hailstones that are an inch in diameter, it's pretty hard to get your airplanes off the ground. It's pretty hard to, uh, uh, to, to take your, uh, uh, your, uh, your troops on the ground and put them out into an environment where you have stones coming out of the sky that are you know, uh, an inch across and can be pretty painful unless you have protection. And if uh, the highways are flooded out and this kind of thing. So you can see how you can use the weather in a way that would give you an advantage, particularly if the aircraft that are sort of leading the charge into uh, uh, you know, a particular geographical area happen to be what they call all-weather capable. In other words, they can, they can actually uh, use uh, different kinds of sensor arrays, whether it's infrared or radar or whatever it might be, to actually see through the weather conditions to be able to uh, determine what the enemy troop movements might be, what their uh, logistical support might be, what, uh, what the placement of their different weapon systems might be. This is just one thing. Another thing might be um, 
that you want to be able to, I mean, one of the things that, that has been talked about more recently is what they call weather derivatives, where you, you actually have people that are making investments, uh, sort of uh, in a bet, uh, making a wager in a way, um, that um, a particular crop that's uh, being grown, say, in Iowa or someplace like that, um, may not actually be able to be harvested because uh, a weather disaster will wipe out the crop. And so let's say the crop is worth, uh, just uh, for the heck of it, it's worth $5 million dollars, if it's brought to the market in its in its you know most ideal condition, but um, you have a company that decides that well maybe it might not make it to the market, but you want to insure that crop for say twenty million dollars, maybe four times what its actual uh, market value would be, and then of course if you happen to be someone that's uh, affiliated with another company that uh, you know a thousand miles to the west is chemtrailing. Uh, and you know that in combination with an incoming weather system, this augmentation process that you've just created is going to create flooding in the area where you've got this insured crop, you can wipe out the crop and actually wind up benefiting uh, four times as as much uh, financially by the loss of the crop as opposed to the harvesting and marketing of the crop. So this is something that has a tremendous impact on populations because number one, it means the denial of the food that would have been realized from that crop, but it also is being used as a tool for uh, buying up large tracts of land, particularly if you're a company that is in the process of trying to corner the market uh, as far as the distribution of genetically modified crops. So you can see how something is is seemingly disconnected from, from food uh, you know, being chemtrails, you can see how uh, this kind of process could be um, really uh, rather um, uh, kind of uh, frightening in terms of the impact that it has on populations, on the food supply, on the cost of food, uh, even the transportation of food. All of these things can be affected by the, uh, the impact downrange that these kinds of things happen when they're put into the atmosphere and they're used or exploited to their maximum effect. Um, another thing that um, you might consider or, or you, you might look at is, is what, um, what are the um, side effects of putting uh, highly reflective materials into the atmosphere like aluminum oxide, which tends to be kind of a silvery white color, very reflective, um, the origin of aluminum oxide being used in aviation goes all the way back to uh, um, the the very earliest uses of radar, for example. Uh, experiments were done in the uh, the 1930s and 1940s when the first the first um, active use of radar was beginning to um, be looked at, where you could take a signal and send it out into the environment, and if there was something like an airplane flying in that environment it would reflect a portion of that signal back to your transmitting antenna. And because you know that the signal goes out at the speed of light and it takes, you know, so many fractions of a second to go out, and then if it's reflected off a target in that environment, it comes back, you can, you know, basically range the distance. And that's kind of what um, radar stands for, is radio ranging and detection. And so what you find is that you can... You can see a target, not, not visibly, but you can see it at great distance by using this electronic signal that goes out, reflects back, and helps you to determine where the target is and what direction it's going in. So it gives you sort of a, an intelligence advantage in terms of a military strategy. But if you have um, a, a way of defeating that system by, say, spraying aluminum particles, what was called chaff, into the environment, you not only have a way of, of sort of defeating the ability of that radar system to determine where you're going, but it can actually mask the movement of large, uh, uh, large uh, fleets of ships or aircraft by putting up a, what amounts to a reflective curtain that prevents uh, you as, as the, uh, the defender from seeing what's happening beyond that curtain with your radar. Well, this is the same kind of thing that could be uh, used, uh, well, the same application of the same kind of principle that might be used um, in spraying chemtrails. Let's say that your country has developed a a super advanced propulsion technology, something that is, um, uh, well, for for lack of a a more scientific term, you might call it field propulsion or anti-gravity 
uh, or electroglavitic propulsion. These are some of the, the terms that you hear being kicked around in the UFO community and, and in some parts of the military and defense community. Um, but let's say, for example, that, that you uh, uh, have actually successfully created uh, this kind of a propulsion system that allows you to travel at uh, uh, tens of thousands of miles per hour to make uh, instantaneous accelerations from a, a hovering stop to uh, 15 or 20,000 miles per hour in an instant, and that because of the way the, the field propulsion system works, you know, the pilot inside is not squashed by the G-forces and this kind of thing. And this can all be explained, of course, but the point is that this gives you a tremendous strategic advantage throughout the world. Imagine that you could go from you know, the middle of the United States to the middle of Russia in under a minute's time. That's, that's far beyond the, 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 the capability of even the fastest missiles that are in, um, in deployment right now anywhere in the world. And so that represents a tremendous strategic advantage in terms of being able to project force into enemy territory or to, you know, impart some kind of damage to their resources uh, or, or their, uh, the military uh, equipment. So if you have this kind of a system, but you want to be able to train your pilots and you want to be able to have flight operations, and you want to be able to um, uh, base these kinds of uh, vehicles in a number of places throughout the world so that they're not all concentrated in one place. In other words, you don't want to keep all your eggs in one basket, but you want these things to be deployed throughout the world, but you don't want anyone to know. What do you do? <laughs> well, what you do is you put something up in the atmosphere that makes them much harder to see. And one of the ways that you might do that is by chemtrailing over populated areas, which is exactly what we're seeing. And uh, those chemtrails not only help to obscure uh, viewing of any kind of self-luminous object, and many of these particular vehicles do seem to have that characteristic, that they, they glow, uh, particularly at night, but even during the daytime if they're operating at their most uh, highly energized state of operation. Um, you can see them glowing like a light bulb at altitude in a clear sky. So if, if there's a white haze uh, over your area, and you've got a, a vehicle of this type that's operating at uh, 50 or 60,000 feet, it's just a little tiny point of light. And the haze, um, created mostly by the sunlight reflecting off all these particles that have been distributed into the air, makes it much, much more difficult to see. Uh, Absolutely. And Mark, Mark, I was going to say, you know, we're going to come, we're coming up on a hard break right now. But um, okay. when we do get back, I mean, you're going right in into the area of which we would um, love to hear a whole lot more of, which is going to be, you know, you just mentioned a, a whole mouthful and I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> I really do. I mean, it's just amazing. You're, you're absolutely amazing. Um, but uh, we can talk a little bit more about that that whole, you know, sky blanket in the sky. Um, it would explain a lot. It would explain a lot of the night spring, too. Um, and then definitely I've got a couple of questions that I want your personal opinion on. So right okay. when, we back, when we, yeah, when we get back from the break, it'll just be a few minutes. When we get back, we're going to talk more about that. And, of course, you're listening. So, Mark, right when we left off, um, you were just starting to talk about the, uh, you know, the actual chemtrails, possibly, you know, uh, yet a another, as you said, the imagination could go anywhere with this. And, and, and it's probably being used for just about anything you could imagine. Yeah. Um, so with the idea of these blankets of clouds that these, you know, chemtrails, these contrails, you know, expand and make that's already been fully worldwide. You know, that's established. The public is well aware of it. Um, those who are in the know, very well aware where you could just watch it from your own backyard. You can watch it happen and you can see that the whole sky gets covered up with this stuff. And is it possible? See, I've noticed a pattern out here. With, with they, they stopped spraying for many, many, many months in 2012. Yeah, same thing here. Is that right? It's all moved offshore. It's out over the Pacific now. So we're seeing a big drought here because uh, – when every time you see uh, chemtrails, you don't see any rain. And, I know. Uh, the two was, go together. You're exactly right. And this year, we had our first monsoon in four years with rain. Yeah. 
Well, I think what's happening is that they're beginning to realize that um, some of these things are becoming obvious to the uh, to the average individual. And one of the things we've noticed uh, here is that um, uh, when we saw chemtrails, we never saw any rain. It was as though this uh, process was actually capturing the moisture and putting it down somewhere else and often putting it down in, in tremendous quantities. Um, and this is where a lot of the flooding uh, was going in the central United States. That's where all it was all our moisture that was being dumped in mass uh, in the central part of the United States. And and um, it turns out that uh, one of the things that you actually find in some of the patents about uh, this this kind of activity is what they call moisture sequestration. You basically take the moisture from one area and you transport it. You you sort of convey it to an, to another location, and then you use the the, uh, the these nanoparticles uh, as a um, a means of sort of capturing the the moisture and carrying it to a place where you can then heat the uh, uh, heat the nanoparticles up, cause them to rise to a higher altitude where it condenses and becomes a low pressure system, and then it rains. And one of the things that we found was happening is that when we did get rain uh, from storms that were engineered using this kind of pr- process is that uh, there was a tremendous amount of aluminum oxide that was in the rain. And it started showing up in the snow shed uh, coming off of uh, mountains like Mount, uh, Mount Rainier, uh, Mount Lassen, uh, Mount Shasta here in northern uh, California. And some of the water coming off of these, uh, these melting snow masses on the top of these mountains was so full of aluminum oxide that the water was actually toxic. It would be harmful for you to drink it. And, of course, when the aluminum oxide gets into the soil, it raises the alkalinity dramatically. And it's actually killing off some of the most uh, hardy plants that you'll find, like uh, the, uh, the manzanita that grows up here in Northern California. Um, some of these plants are, uh, you, know, uh, you know, many decades old. Some are several hundred years old, and they're, and they're all dying off. A lot of the forests are dying. And the other problem that you have is that it turns out that aluminum oxide is... One of the components is used in high temperature thermate and super thermite explosives. And so when there's a forest fire, and, and, and the whole thing is just when you look at it from top to bottom, you put all this aluminum oxide in the air. Aluminum oxide is a conductor of electricity. So you have all these fine particles floating in the air, which raises the electrostatic potential of the air, which means that it conducts electricity much easier. So when a storm system does come through and is turning up the atmosphere, you see many hundreds of times more lightning strikes than what you would typically expect to see. Last year, we had a storm roll into this area. We did not get a lot of rain, but we had 8,500 lightning strikes in the course of about four hours. It produced over 1,000 forest fires, some of which all came together in the area of the Lassen National Forest uh, near Mount Lassen, which is a dormant volcano uh, uh, east of Redding. Some of these fires in the last few years uh, have cost the state of California over 20 to $25 million a piece to suppress. So you can see what a tremendous impact this has, not only the resources of the state, but agriculturally it's causing a tremendous amount of problem because there are crops here that will not grow very well in aluminum-rich uh, soil. And it just so happens that uh, Monsanto, in the last year or so, have patented a number of crops that will flourish in aluminum-rich soil. So you have to imagine that there's got to be some kind of a connection between their having advanced knowledge that this particular kind of organism, this particular type of crop, is going to be of benefit and allow them to have a corner on the market in agriculture if they know that the soil that these seeds are going to be planted in has an unusually high amount of aluminum oxide. You, there's just no denying it. So you can see how this kind of a process would actually uh, help a company to establish a monopoly in agriculture. Now, most people don't even realize this, but agriculture in the United States is actually many billions of dollars more lucrative than the production and refinement of oil. They, there's more money exchanging hands in agriculture than there is in the entire petroleum industry. Um, and so it, it's, you know, and when you consider how many people are dependent upon the products that are produced uh, as a result of agricultural activity, you can see what a tremendous impact that this kind of uh, uh, manipulation of the market would have on a population. 
not only in the United States, but worldwide. Yeah, this so, is global, absolutely. You're, yeah. you're describing, you know, a similar shenanigans that, you know, uh, happened with the mortgage-backed securities. I mean, basically, what they're doing, you know, when you you when, when you spoke earlier about the derivatives, this is all this is all about money and control and creating money out of thin air. That's true, and and you know, it it isn't just limited to agriculture. I mean, look no. at all of. I mean, since the fires, we we had some fires here uh, about uh, two to three months ago that uh, took out um, something approaching. Uh, 100 or 200 square miles of forest uh, just to the east side of Mount Lassen. Um, and we haven't seen very much logging up here because of all of the uh, uh, lawsuits that have been filed over the years by various <laughs> environmental organizations. But now, every single day, we see logging trucks coming out of the Lassen National Forest with these huge trees that have been cut down in order to clear away all the damaged timber uh, that, that, of course... Uh, the federal government comes in and they pump millions of dollars into the the reforestation process, planting new trees, clearing away all the dead trees, and very often some of these big trees you find that um, the the evolution of these plants, these big ponderosa pines and so forth, mm-hmm. the, the bark has actually developed a kind of resistance to uh, to fire. It protects the inner core of the tree. The outside of the tree may burn to a certain degree. The pine cones and everything, pine needles and everything burn off. But the core of the tree itself is still harvestable lumber. And so the lumber industry is seeing a tremendous amount of of, uh, of material coming into the market right now, which, of course, also means that lumber as a commodity uh, is, is, um, is cheaper. You'll find that lumber is going to start looking cheaper because of all of the harvesting of the lumber. So this has an impact on the market. It means that uh, certain companies like Sierra Pacific and stuff may start capturing a, a, a greater market share. And, and why? Because of something being put into the atmosphere. But what they're finding also is because aluminum oxide is two atoms of aluminum and three atoms of oxygen. And so any time aluminum is subjected to high heat, it will either take on the three, um, the three atoms of oxygen or it will give them off as part of the combustion process. And, and in the process of doing that, you say if it's, if it's uh, giving up the oxygen in, in part of a fire, it makes the fire much hotter, like uh, adding oxygen to an oxyacetylene welding rig. You can cut through steel. And so what they're finding is that many of these conifers, these, these pine cone type plants, the, the, the pine trees, their evolution has been based on a system where um, very often the, the, the pine cones themselves release, they expand and they release their seeds when there is a, a, a small fire on the ground. And so they've evolved uh, with fire and forest fire being part of the, the germination process. But what they're finding now is that the fires that are occurring now because of the aluminum oxide that's in the environment is so hot that the pine cones are being destroyed and the, the future seeds of the forest are being destroyed in the process too. It's sterilizing the sand and the soil down to a depth of a couple of feet so that nothing, no bacteria, no worms, no nothing grows in the soil. And it's sterilizing the land. And so you have to wonder... Um, you know, do they really know what they're doing? Is this something that was intentional? Is this is this a way of destroying uh, North America? I mean, is 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 there some kind of a covert war going on that we don't know about? What's happening here? Because from my point of view, uh, this is a very very dangerous game that somebody's playing. Now, uh, agreed. Um, what about um, the idea of these craft that are being seen? In these clouds, I don't. I'm not talking about chemtrail planes. I'm talking about other uh, triangular and other craft that have been spotted and filmed. Um, basically, like I had said earlier, you know, breaking up clouds, breaking up moisture clouds, um, jumping around from cloud to cloud, and so forth and so forth. Um, is there a possibility that we have a whole black project? I guess funded. Uh, exotic planes flying around or ex- exotic craft or even ET craft, I don't know, that are also part of the, 
part of our skies, part of what is behind these chemtrails or behind these larger clouds that we're seeing that are fake or artificial clouds. I mean, that's a fact. They're artificial. Um, can you talk to that at all or ho- hol- holographic images maybe even? And, and what, would, what would be the purpose of all that anyway? Well, as I was suggesting before, if you have a really sophisticated or advanced kind of, uh, of uh, weapon system or aircraft, Mm-hmm. Um, uh, maybe uh, a combination aircraft, spacecraft that's capable of completely going outside the atmosphere or a- exoatmospheric, as mm-hmm. some of the uh, people in the aviation industry like to say. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and you don't want anybody to know about this. I mean, something that you're you're putting into production quietly, um, so that uh, you know if the need arises in the future and there's some kind of a uh, say a conflict or an invasion by uh, Chinese forces hovering. Uh, in their ships off the coast of California, as we've been hearing about more recently. Um, uh, yeah, you might want to put something up in the air that prevents uh, the average person from knowing about it. Um, uh, just coincidentally, I mean, I've, I've seen just about every other kind of craft you can imagine in the air, uh, you know, everything from spheres to saucers to cigar shapes, uh, uh, even uh, vehicles that appeared to change shape as they were flying around. I saw my first triangle. Uh, on the 14th of September at 1.45 in the morning. And the thing that was so um, strange about this particular sighting, it was uh, a night where there was, I think the moon had already gone down. It was uh, completely dark. Uh, I was just stargazing, and I saw this this object moving along at about the pace of, uh, say, an airliner uh, making its final approach to an airport, except that this triangular-shaped object had no anti-collision lights. It didn't have any of the red, white, or, uh, or bluish-green uh, uh, lights on it that would um, you know, let any other aircraft in the air know that it was there. But the most disturbing thing about this sighting was that it, it was a fairly low altitude. It, it couldn't have been more than, say, 2,000 feet off the ground. It had uh, a wingspan that I would say approximated that of a 737, and it was uh, kind of a, a little bit wider than it was long. Um, but the thing that, that gave it away was the fact that it was so low that the, the lights of the city of Reading, where I live, were causing the underside of the vehicle to be illuminated in a sort of a dull orange glow, even though the vehicle itself was black. And that's how I was able to see it. But probably most disturbing of all was that it was absolutely silent. It made no noise. There was no sound of an aircraft, you know, the turbulence that comes off, or the, or the, the, the typically the, the noise that's produced by jet engines is caused by the shearing forces of the, the high-speed gases coming out of the exhaust uh, behind the engines of the aircraft. That's what actually causes the roar that you hear. It's the shearing of the high-speed gases moving past the still atmosphere. And there was none of that. There was no sound at all. Now, you know, I've been observing aircraft ever since I was a little kid because my dad was in the Air Force. I went to a lot of air shows. I've been around aircraft. I've worked on them. I've flown in them. Um, and uh, and I've, I've helped uh, in the design of some of the more recent uh, aircraft that um, are flying around right now or being flight tested. And, and um, this was like, uh, it was unlike anything that I'd ever seen, uh, except for possibly the, the TR-3. Um, but uh, even with the familiarity that I had um, on the TR-3, I thought that this particular aircraft had slightly different proportions. It was, it was actually wider. It wasn't so much uh, a Dorito shape or an equilateral triangle. It was more of a wider, almost like a flying wing, but, but not anything like uh, the B-2 stealth bomber. And so it was clear to me that you know there's, there's obviously something else going on up there, something flying, flying around. Um, and so I think that, yes, you could obscure things, but, but I also think you talked about holograms and we, we, mm. we spoke about this before. I know that when holograms and three dimensional, uh, the idea of three dimensional photography first came out, I think it was in the sixties, uh, national geographic and some other scientific publications were talking about the process of producing holograms using photographic plates. And one of the things that they found in the process of producing holograms was that you could take, say, an 8 by 10 inch photographic plate and you could photograph something using uh, two different sources of laser light or coherent light to illuminate 
the subject in the photograph. And when you reproduce the the um, uh, the the lighting conditions with another laser in using the photographic plate, that it would reproduce a three-dimensional image, and you could move side to side, and you would have the perception of this object having depth and height and all those kinds of qualities. But what they found was that if you cut that photographic image in half, it would still reproduce a, a, a albeit a smaller version. It would still produce the entire image of that three-dimensional object. And each time you cut the photographic plate into a smaller section, you'd still get the full image, albeit a little bit smaller, in each one of those plates. And so what they found was is that the photographic image in the hologram was literally recorded in, in every grain of the film, even at the microscopic scale. And so when I started thinking about that process, I realized that you could replicate this using the, the principle of chemtrailing, literally produce holograms, three-dimensional images in the sky. And so uh, back in the 1980s, there was a program, and I, I don't recall what the scientific or the, the, uh, the research, uh, uh, the title of the research program was, but they had found a way where they could take uh, the, the ionization in the upper atmosphere that was created by micrometeorites coming down through the atmosphere, and this ionization could then be used as kind of a platform or a surface upon which you could illuminate and create three-dimensional images using lasers, almost like a hologram. But it wasn't very reliable because a lot of that depended on how much of this microscopic meteoric uh, debris was coming into the atmosphere at any one time. Obviously, it works a lot better when there's more meteorites coming in, but you can't always depend on that. So it occurred to me, just like if you've ever seen these these little um, lines that they paint on the highway and you put on your high beams and you can see the, the line stretching way out in the distance, it actually seems to have a reflective quality. Well, the way they do that is they have little tiny microscopic spheres of glass that are perfectly polished spheres of glass produced in pretty much the same way that nanoparticles of aluminum oxide and the chemtrails are. They sprinkle the glass on the wet paint as they're spraying these lines on the highway. And so every one of those little spheres of glass, it basically offers a, a, an omnidirectional, a single direction reflection of your headlights coming back at you, which includes the color of the line that's on the highway. That's why they're so bright when you look way out in the distance in the dark. You won't even see the highway, but you can still see the lines, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, imagine that instead of sprinkling these little glass beads all over the ground on the paint where they only stick on the wet paint, that you spray them out into the air. What happens? You're doing the same thing on a much, much larger and much more reflective scale than you would be doing if you were depending only on the ionization of these micrometeorites coming in through the atmosphere. So suddenly, you'd have this beautiful reflective palette upon which you could paint almost any kind of a laser image in holographic form because obviously the, uh, the chemtrail clouds have a, a certain depth or thickness within the mm -hmm. atmosphere itself, which is what gives you the perception of depth. Now, if, realizing, of course, that these particles are all fairly widely distributed through the atmosphere, it's, it's, it's the kind of thing, it, it would probably be no worse than the, the dust that floats up off of uh, a kitty litter trail when you're sifting kitty litter, you know. It's not something that's going to cause you problems with your breathing because it's so high up and it's so widely distributed, but because of the, the, the perfect resolution of each of these little tiny microspheres of glass floating in the air at higher altitude, even if they settle down, it's basically just silica anyway, so it's not going to be detectable in the environment per se. But if you use a number of powerful lasers, and, and when I was working uh, extensively with the Boeing company on their airborne laser and their tactical airborne laser systems. I can tell you that there are powerful, powerful laser systems that could be used to produce dramatic, very large-scale images. I mean, imagine something like the huge flying saucer from the uh, the movie <laughs> Independence Day right. rolling into your neighborhood, coming in over a mountain range, you know, with clouds, you know, unfurling around it, you know, in flames and so forth. It would terrify a population. I mean, you would think that it was the absolute end of the world. And you could do something like that. I mean, imagine, for example, that you want to scare the daylights out of the Taliban over in Afghanistan and put, have them lay down their arms 
imagine that you could project the image of uh, Allah in the sky and speaking in a perfect fluent Persian dialect, say, you know, I am Allah and I command you to lay down your arms and make peace with the Americans. Can you imagine what the impact of that would be? <laughs> yeah, right. That's a well, and, and how many prospect when Allah himself tells you, put down your guns and make peace. It is. I mean, it is. And, hey, Mark, we've got a question from the from one of our okay. listeners. Yeah. And um, and we've only got about five minutes of the show left. So um, how can we turn this monopoly to the advantage of the environment and the human being ourselves? So they want to know how we could turn this around and be, and have the advantage. Well, one of the things that I suggest is that if you understand what's going on and you recognize it in your environment, call the attention of your friends, your family, anyone that you see, even somebody just passing on the street, point them out, point these things out to your friends. And if they're interested, if they'll listen, try and inform them. Uh, Try to get them to look into it themselves because it's only through educating the people around us that we can raise awareness. And if you really have a mind to do so, write your congressman and say, look, uh, you know, I found stuff online. I've seen this for myself. I know this is going on. I can see what the impact is. I can, you know, I can take soil samples down to the local pathology lab and I can see the readings on aluminum, barium, and strontium in the soil. I know that this isn't natural, that this is far beyond what we would normally find in the environment. This is harmful. It's being distributed by aircraft that are certified by the Federal Aviation Administration, and I want to know what the hell's going on. Use the Freedom of Information Act. Look up uh, uh, Title 50, United States Code, Chapter 32 on chemical and biological weapons under Section 1512, where it says specifically that there has to be a paper trail coming all the way down from the president and the Secretary of Health and Human Services that gives written notice to the governors in each state saying when and where these things will be distributed over their territory and their states. There's a paper trail. Demand to see it using the Freedom of Information Act or the, uh, the, the, the Public Records Act in your state. Because once they realize that the citizenry is not going to sit still for this stuff and that they're going to have to answer for everything that's being done, at the very least, they'll have to explain why it is being done. And if it's of some perceived benefit for us as human beings, then they need to explain it to us. Because I think that if, if we really understood that the main reason was because the sun is putting out too much solar energy and it's going to fry the planet, sure, I think everybody could get behind that. But if it's Yeah, let, used, let us know. Exactly. Stop yeah, hiding yeah. it. Hmm? Exactly. But if it's being used in some tactical or strategic way to cause harm to us by reducing the worldwide food supply, by starving people, by depriving people of their land because of weather disasters, when Monsanto and other companies like that come and they buy farmland that's been been given up through bankruptcy for pennies on the dollar so that they can reseed everything with genetically modified crops, you can see how this kind of a process could really have a negative impact on not only Americans, but people all around the world. I mean, there's, there's even evidence that these genetically modified crops are responsible for things like the, uh, the uh, honeybee colony collapse disorder because of the, the kinds of uh, characteristics that are being uh, stripped into the genetic uh, uh, makeup of some of these plants. It turns out that the enzymes that they use to do these modifications happen to be the same kind of enzymes that are being used by the bacteria in the gut of the bee to help break down and digest the food. And so what happens is these bacteria are actually stripping out these characteristics, which usually uh, are responsible for producing a toxin and protects the plant, and the bacteria are incorporating this same toxin, the same characteristic, into their own genetic structure. And so these helpful bacteria, normal bacteria for the bees, actually winds up becoming a pathogen that kills the bees. This is, it's, you know, it's, it's unprecedented, it's harmful, 